welcome to another episode of the Arsenal Women Arsecast on Arsblog.com. At the beginning of the summer, when I was thinking about the beginning of every summer, I have to sit there and think, like, what does content look like for this summer? And this summer I was thinking, oh, every time Arsenal make a new signing, I'll do a podcast on them. And obviously it got to late July and Arsenal hadn't made any signings. And then the one signing we did make... I'm really sorry to say I haven't been able to find someone with an in-depth knowledge of either Danish or US college football uh, to talk about Kalen McCarthy, but um, I might be able to do something about that later in the month. And so I've been sitting and kind of listening to crickets with the rest of you guys and hearing about targets and things like that, but no new signing podcasts until today because... Recording this on Thursday, Arsenal have announced um, the signing, which wasn't really a shock to anyone, I don't think, but the signing of Lena Hurtig from Juventus, a uh, Swedish forward. Another Swedish forward to add to one of Arsenal's other most recent signings, Stina Blackstinius. And exactly as we did when Arsenal signed Stina Blackstinius, I thought who better to get on the podcast to talk about Lena than... Um, I think you've kind of become our Swedish correspondent now, uh, Mia. Uh, Mia Eriksson from Their Pitch Podcast and loads of other places as well. Mia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Very glad to have another Swede in England now <laughs> so we can talk about it again. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and and obviously, you know, we had you on our on our Jonas podcast as well when uh, when Jonas was first appointed, and yeah, I th- I think this is probably going to be quite a rich seam uh, <laughs> during Jonas's uh, tenure because we know the Scandinavian market. He's certainly been looking there um, this summer, and this is uh, well, no, the second signing he's had from the Scandinavian market, I guess, um, but. Before we kind of get into um, what what Lena's been doing more recently, I'm really interested. I think a lot of people will have recognised her from when she went to Juventus in 2020, and obviously she's been a fixture in the Swedish team for some time, but probably came to people's notice a little bit more at Juventus and maybe a bit more when Sweden got to the final of the Olympics last summer. But can you perhaps give us a little bit of background um, on Lena and, and what she was doing before she went to Juventus to, I guess, earn that move? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think she got her breakthrough as a football player with talent uh, when she was in Umeå in Sweden. Uh, then she played in the Dalmatvenskan, obvious, obviously. Uh, but then she she spent a couple of years with Frida Manum and Stina Blackstenius uh, as well in Linköping. So... Obviously, Juventus picked her up from Linköping and she was in Linköping uh, during the World Cup and then Linköping had a really good team on paper <laughs> and everyone was expecting them to just come back from France and and win the league, but they didn't. Uh, but, I mean, Lina is, is uh, one of Sweden's best players, obviously, because she's in our national team and, and uh, no matter what, uh, the Swedish national team is still ranked as the third in the world. So I think that that probably will tell the story without words. Um, but she was a very important player for Linköping. And, and when she left, uh, it yeah, that was a hard player to replace for, for Linköping. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously Sweden um, have no shortage of options in attack, which we'll uh, we'll perhaps touch on a bit later. But what sort of player would you say Lena is? Like, well, I think we've kind of got an idea that she can play across the front line. But what would you say her qualities are? I mean, she is a quality left winger for me. But the fact is that she actually played as a number ten when Sweden played. Uh, against Brazil uh, in the rehearsal of the Euros. Uh, but I would say that her biggest strengths are she's a, she's very good at holding up the ball. Um, she's strong. She's tall. Um, she, her aerial, aerial abilities are really good as well. Um, she's good at ball carrying. Um, and when she is up against many defenders in the box. She can she can hold up the ball uh, with her back turned uh, towards the goal. And obviously, it's it's easy to talk about everything that she's good at with the ball. But I I must say that one of her one of her strengths also is to 
to work off the ball. Uh, and I, I do think that she can provide a lot with that ability to Arsenal and the way they play. Yeah, the the two words that Jonas used in his kind of little um, you know welcome bit that they do on the website when uh, when they get a comment from the manager, he used the words power and dynamism. Um, and I, I guess there's a little bit in my head that's thinking she sounds a bit like Caitlin Ford <laughs> to me, which is not necessarily a bad thing because Jonas loves Caitlin Ford. Um, I don't think like Arsenal have used Caitlin Ford as a centered forward quite a lot, and I don't think that I think they they quite like her out wide, but. Um, you know, I, I believe that Lena gave uh, an interview to the Swedish press um, about about the kind of role that Jonas has in mind for her. Uh, would you mind kind of relaying to us, uh, those of us particularly that don't speak Swedish, what she said in that interview? Yes, she actually said that uh, Jonas has uh, brought her in to Arsenal to play as a left winger. Uh, that's what he intends to use her the most. The fact is that she also can play in the position of Stina Blackstenius. Uh, she can do that, but it's it's like when we watch them play in Sweden, you know what you get when Stina Blackstenius play. She's very good at getting in behind the back lines and, and uh, taking those runs, and she's good at pressing, um, obviously. But, but when Lena Huttig is playing, I mean, she has scored some awesome goals for Sweden in, in times when games really need a goal. Uh, mm. And then she just turns up from nowhere because she's she's using her, she's explosive and, and then she can, she can score from one touch. Uh, she can score from, even if she has defenders marking her, she's just, I mean, if people want to see a really good goal, I do believe it was versus Finland. Uh, when they secured the World Cup uh, qualification uh, at home, that that no, that was versus Ireland. But in the game versus Finland, when they played at home, she she scored a really good goal on a one-touch volley uh, from a cross from Philippa Angeldahl, and that that goal is sort of describes uh, her differences from Stina Blackstenius, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like um, she she sounds like a Jonas player to me, and that he really prizes those kind of physical qualities. He loves Caitlin Ford, obviously loves Stina, brought her in, um, took Vivian Miedema out of the forward line. I think maybe because she doesn't necessarily have, well, she does have those qualities, but you know, she's not like a natural battering ram type. It does make me wonder actually, because Arsenal actually look quite good on the left in terms of having Caitlin Ford and Katie McCabe there. And actually on the right is more where Arsenal have a bit of a gap with Nikita Paris gone. And it makes me wonder whether Caitlin Ford might play on the right um, on occasion. But we saw Lena play on the right for Sweden this summer. um, And she didn't play brilliantly, to be fair. Sweden did also try uh, Kena Rid, who, who I'll ask you about a bit later, and uh, Sophia Jakobsen kind of played there um, against England. And I, I don't think any of them really showed their true quality. What, why do you think it was that, um, I guess, first of all, focusing on, on Lena, why she didn't kind of show her best at this summer's Euros? I do think, and I do know, because this has been talked about a lot in Sweden and in Swedish media with the Swedish head coach, Peter Jarachon, after that he actually admitted uh, the day after Sweden had played uh, against England and was out, that he was disappointed at himself uh, that he couldn't find the perfect role for Lina Huttig this summer in the Swedish national team. Uh, they didn't use her at her best uh, abilities. And he actually said that that was one thing he regretted. Uh, but I do think that that's much up to the fact that we have Fridolina Rolfa, who perhaps also not did show her best um, mm. at Euros. But I do think that Lina Huttig and, and Fridolina Rolfa, that's two left wingers, and they are playing in quality clubs, uh, both of them. And that's a... How do you say? It, it's a luxury problem. Um, mm. But I do think that Lina Huttig was the one that kind of suffered uh, because of that, because she was tried in different roles rather than to actually just be played where she's comfortable, we know what she can do. 
uh, but that role was Fridolina Rolfas. Yeah, yeah. And and of course, yeah, Stina, I don't think showed her best in the tournament either. And like you said, Lena, I believe, started that first game up front when, when Stina was injured. So she moved around a little bit. Um, and, and I don't really think any Swedish player certainly showed their best at the tournament. Um, what about in terms of her character because you've referenced two players that you know very well um, that she played with a Lin Chopping in Frieda Marnham and Stina Blackstinius and what's uh, what those two have got in common as, as kind of characters is and particularly Stina and I know she's talked about this before she's very shy very quiet very reserved um, kind of character what what kind of character are Arsenal getting in in Lina Hurtig? I actually, I, I did one interview with Lina Huttig and Lisa Huttig, who is her wife, when they played together in Linköping. I must really say this because that was the first time they they accepted to be interviewed together. But Lisa was the one that talked and Lina was the one that was very quiet. They actually joked about that because they, uh, as a couple, are very uh, different in, in personality, but they do... I mean, they are two awesome people. Uh, I really love them, and but I I would say that she is very humble. Uh, she's not that talkative. I I know that she would des- describe herself like this as well. Um, but but she's very humble, quiet, and hardworking. I would say. Um, I don't think it's this is not a player who will take place. Uh, if if that's not given to her um, off the pitch, for example, but on the pitch, I know she will she will show off uh, when she's able to. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's interesting because obviously Jonas has only been in the job for a year, and last summer window, a couple of the signings were his, but but not really. And so, you know, you're starting to build up like whether he has a type in terms um, and whether that's a coincidence, whether it's just the type of player he likes to to be like that or whether that's the type of character that that he really wants in the dressing room. Um, I I still don't know about that. But I mean, Arsenal, what what I know that Arsenal were really looking for, that they obviously they lost Nikita Paris and Tobin Heath but both of whom didn't really contribute last season that much for for different reasons. And what they were really looking for, they didn't want to sign. I think they wanted to sign a player who could, who could, you know, fill in across the front line effectively. Um, Now Nikita didn't fit in because I really just don't think she's a, she's, I don't think she's uh, kind of fits for a counter pressing team. It wasn't Jonas's signing. I think it was pretty clear, pretty quickly that that wasn't really um, ever going to work. And I'm actually glad that Arsenal found a quick kind of solution to that. And everyone just said, this isn't going to work. Let's just call it quits here. How do you see um, Lena fitting in um, into Arsenal's front line, which actually in terms of personnel in particular looks you know, it's beginning and, 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 you know, there could be more additions in that forward line yet. How do you see her fitting in both into Arsenal's kind of forward line and their, their suite of options, but also into Jonas's style? I think you, you mentioned it yourself now because with the counter pressing and, and I just said that I know that she's great off the ball and I do think that she will provide to, to Arsenal's uh, front line because of that. But then... I mean, I must mention, because I'm a Swede, of course, that, I mean, Lina and Stina has played together. Um, they know each other's strengths. They know they know each other. So I'm very keen on seeing what Jonas can get out of that partnership as well um, in the WSL and obviously in, in European football uh, in the Champions League. Um, I do think that... Speaking of what Sweden has in the front line, I do think that Lina and, and Stina is like the best mix you can get. Mm. Um, what they don't have, perhaps, uh, or Lina in, in this uh, thing is is uh, long range shot, shots. Uh, that that's pretty much much it. But then you have Viviana Midema for that. <laughs> so yeah. 
<laughs> so here you get a player that can show up and and she scores really nice headers in mm. set pieces. I do think you have a player now who is who is very like uh, she's going to be very dangerous for for you when you during corner kicks and free kicks. Um, and then you have the fact that she is a player that can just make a run uh, in inside the box when when a cross com- comes and score on one touch uh, on volley. So I'm expecting. I mean, I do think people have been sleeping on Lina Huttig a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. That's my feeling, because every time Sweden plays, uh, we have a commentator in Sweden uh, that. Uh, that is called jo- Marcus Johansson. He's called, and he often uh, do commenting uh, for the Swedish national teams games. And he always praises Lina Huttig, mostly because of her work off the ball. But when she gets the ball and she scores, she always, and and she's very reliable for Sweden. Obviously, I mean she scores when when it's needed. So she's not she's not going to score thirty goals for you. But that's that's Dina Blackstein's job, <laughs> yeah. in a way. But I do think that we will see her like thrive in in the WSL and in Jonas' style of playing football. Yeah, and mentioning like long range goals there. There's also Katie McCabe um, as well, who kind of exactly. specializes in those. But I, I guess what's um, interesting in terms of Arsenal's forward line is really Stina has got that centre forward position. I think that's hers, and probably Lena. Yep, will, Lena or Caitlin will will kind of be the backup there. Viv has that number ten role. That's hers. She will start most games there. Beth Mead has that right wing role. That's hers. She will start most games there. So the, the the and you know obviously with what you said about what Lena said about playing on the left, that's clearly that's where her biggest opportunity is going to be. But there's still Katie McCabe and Caitlin Ford there. How how do you see that competition? And do you think that that's something that Lena will relish? I do think that I, I think she's going to work hard to to prove that she is going to be Jonas' number one choice uh, on the left wing. Um, I do think that maybe perhaps she will have to have a coach that really believes in her in that position and the way she plays. Um, and it's like, I mean, obviously Jonas he is Swedish, so I'm kind of hoping that that he will give her a chance to 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 prove herself um but it's going to be interesting and it's like you say i i do think that the fact is that lina is one she's very similar to players jonas uh, already has um you said at the beginning uh, that this is good because obviously if you take a player in with a completely different profile uh it can be like very hard to change playing style for that um, player. We've seen it in Chelsea. <laughs> yeah. So so I do think that it's better to be consistent like with the players you take in. And I do think a player like Lina Hutig will, will take advantage of that rather than to be different from from other players. Yeah, and as you know, as well as um, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as, you know, not perhaps not being brilliant for Sweden in the Euros for for uh, for reasons that we've discussed, I mean her numbers for Juve last season not don't jump out at you, um, considering the fact that they they tend to win the league quite easily, and you know she was she was playing I think a lot of games on on the left, um, and you talked about like uh, you know hoping that Jonas has like real belief in her. Do you get the feeling perhaps that maybe, Joe, you know, Joe Montemoro, the events coach, someone we know very well as well. And I know that Joe wanted to sign Caitlin Ford um, as well, actually, which, you know, I don't know whether that says something about what he thought of Lena. Or did, you know, but why do you think she had a, a particularly average season at Juve last year? Yeah, that I mean, I, I've been thinking about that a lot as well, but... The fact is that I do think, for me, it's like if the coach has, has to believe in in your abilities, and and then it's it's so much else around um, things. If 
if you want to use her off the ball, like I, I think it, it's about playing style. Like Joe Montemoreau, he likes possession. Mm. Uh, he wants to keep it. And and then maybe because Lina Hurtig is not uh, the most technical uh, player you will have. Um, but then you have Jonas, who is who wants to play more direct and uh, perhaps wide, use the wide uh, wing, his wide wingers in a way. So I do think that that could be a factor, um, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and there's there's a little part of me, you know, there there were, um, and one of the reasons I was so keen to ask about like that competition on the left is I think one of the problems. For Arsenal, I mean, it wasn't a huge problem last season, but might be a problem going forward. Is there were just squad players that we didn't really get anything from, um, like Nikita Paris, like Jordan Nobbs was on the bench a lot. Mana Iwabuchi is a brilliant player, but I just don't really think fits Jonas's style either. And there's a big part of me that just thinks that Iwabuchi, maybe Iwabuchi and um, and uh, Lena should have been a swap deal or something, because uh, I, I don't really see how she how she kind of fits in i guess um but but you're right like we know the types of we joe played daniel van der donk on the left uh, mainly and that shows you what what he wants he wants that kind of that kind of keeping the ball and and, and i think it, it sounds a bit more like lena's in the lena lena and stinner as it were uh, are in that more kind of direct kind of mold um speaking of which i know a player you and i spoke about a lot this summer um don't worry about the dog we've <laughs> Thoroughly welcome dog noises on this podcast. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> and um, and a player you and I spoke about uh, offline a, f- a fair bit this summer is uh, uh Johan. You- Let me see if I get the first <laughs> name right now. Having discussed how to pronounce her surname, uh, Johanna uh, Kainerud. Um, yes. Yeah. Who who went to Chelsea? Um, obviously a very different style of player from um, from Lena, like in terms of being a real like take players on. And, and I have to say, I thought that might interest Jonas, to be honest. I thought he might be interested in that, that kind of very direct take players on type winger. He was very interested in JC, who ended up going to Barcelona. Do you think that she would have been, first of all, um, do you think she would have been a better fit for Arsenal than Chelsea? Yes, <laughs> I have to say it. I'm not saying it's going to be a disaster in, in Chelsea for her because uh, I do think that when you, when you haven't got any player like that, she could be a, a, an asset. Uh, but it could be it could be the the other way around as well for her. Like for her, uh, that's the only thing. But I was so sure that. Uh, no, I wasn't sure because of, I mean, the background story, because she played in Rosengård before and she left. And obviously that must have uh, played a part mm. or must if if Arsenal was interested in Johanna. But the fact is that she is, she is also a bit different from your wingers that you have now. Because when she gets the ball, she can go, she's like very good 1v1 with the ball and she's very fast um so i could have easily seen her uh in arsenal yeah i i i wondered whether whether jonas would be interested but of course i didn't realize that i i knew that she played uh for him at, at rosengord but i hadn't she she left because of lack of game time right is, is, yes is that, yeah yeah she did yeah, so, so that's, <laughs> that would put the kibosh on it uh, if, if Arsenal were indeed interested. But a player we definitely know Arsenal were interested in was uh, Yelena Tankovic. And uh, so I'm going to ask you about her as well, because she's obviously playing in Sweden. Well, at the moment, um, I think in the coming days that will no longer be the case. But very reliable reporting from Sweden says that Arsenal and Chelsea met uh, both met um, her release clause, but it looks like she's going to Chelsea. Um, why? I, I mean, do you have any um, opinion on why she might choose Chelsea over Arsenal? No, I haven't, because she played a lot under Jonas uh, in Rosengård. Um, and she was, I would say, she was his most important player in Rosengård. And she has been the Dalmatian's most important player for 
for those years she has been here and she's very consistent. Um, so I was actually, obviously when, when these reports came, the Chelsea and Arsenal was, had both uh, met the release clause, you, you immediately start to think that, oh, this is interesting. I wonder what she thinks of Jonas mm-hmm. uh, and, and the fact is. But, but, I mean, I do think also that Chelsea and Arsenal are obviously both, uh, both big brands, uh, not just big football clubs with, with a great history. But I do think that, that Chelsea might end up winning the race uh, about players at the moment because of the fact that they do win have they have won the league uh, three times in a row um, and also about the fact that you you see the playing styles I mean they are different uh, and in the way that players um, are being used so it could be that or it could be the fact that she also wasn't that into Jonas you never know I mean it's yeah. It's about personalities and coaching, uh, coaches and and player relationships. And we don't know a thing. And it could be about money, salary. We don't know. Mm -hmm. So, but, but she, she is a great player. And, and also I was thinking about the fact that, okay, is she also going to go to Chelsea because she played like a number, like a number 10 in a 4-3-3 formation in Rosengård. Um, but then a couple of days later, it just hit me that she is brought into Chelsea uh, to replace G. Yeah. 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 That, that's why it always struck me as an odd target for Arsenal because Arsenal have, like, obviously they have Miedema playing number 10. They got Jordan Nobbs who can play as a 10 or as an eight. They've got Manor Iwabuchi. They've got Frieda Marnham as well. And so it did strike, it's one area of the squad I look at and think, we really don't need someone there. Um, and, you know, maybe like long-term Kim Little um, kind of replacement. But again, like that would suggest maybe a lack of faith in Freedom Arnhem um, to do that, or, albeit should do that role very differently. But I, I don't think there are any Kim Littles out on the market. I don't, I don't think we're going to be signing, you know, if, if and when we come to that bridge and we decide we need to replace Kim Little, I, I don't think that we're going to find Kim Little on the market. But, but no. you're right. <laughs> but you're right, like Chelsea... There's potentially a gap in that midfield. They, they've lost G. Um, Melanie Leupoltz, um is on maternity leave, so they they do need reinforcement in midfield. They are trying. They, you know, they tried for Amandine Henri. They they tried for uh, Guerrero as well. So that you know, the midfield is perhaps the one place in the Chelsea squad that isn't absolutely overflowing. So um, yeah, we'll we'll see on that um, anyway. But. Um, but yeah, re- really looking forward to seeing uh, Lena in, in an Arsenal shirt. Just finally, um, what has the reaction been in, in Sweden to uh, another international player coming to Arsenal? Yeah, obviously it's been headlines uh, among sports media today. Uh, and also the fact is that the Italian league uh, went pro uh, this spring. Uh, it's also a rather great fact i think that lina hutig is the first player that is being bought out from her contract in in the italian league from another big european club so i do think that today has been it's it's an historical day i think for swedish football for arsenal for for italian football and i do think that we have to we have to mention that because now it's it's happening now uh, and, and these things they they are just going to come more often. Yeah, yeah. And not many players left in that, you know, when you look at that Sweden starting lineup, who, you know, m- majority of them playing in England now, other than, you know, Rolf, a um, couple of others, but uh, very, very WSL dominated. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I, I won't say it's a good thing yet because mm-hmm. I want to see this season because the fact is that. This is also a risk for for the Swedish players when they go to to big clubs. Um, now I have faith in Jonas because he's Swedish, and <laughs> he would probably want want to make it happen for Sweden uh, next summer uh, in the World Cup. But the fact is that we see players go to big clubs now, uh, and they don't get to start. They don't. Mm. They aren't leading figures. 
uh, at all in the same way as they were uh, ahead of the Olympics. Um, so it's a different look at Filippa Angeldahl in Manchester City. She was yeah. she was Sweden's greatest players in the Olympics last summer and ruled that midfield together with Caroline Segen. And, and this summer she came from a season with with no regular game time. Yeah, yeah, and and actually, um, I, I was going and, and by the way, Car- the loss of Caroline uh, Seeger as well during the Euros, I think, very, very pivotal into into why perhaps Sweden's best performance was the one that she played in. I think uh, the first half of that Netherlands game. But I was going to ask you as well because um, of, of Steena as well, and one of the questions I asked you was about like whether she was ready for this kind of step, and she'd been to Montpellier, and that didn't really work for her. Um, what about Steena then? Um, before we let you go, um, you're kind of so. I I said to to put it on record again. I said on our our mailbag podcast, this is perhaps a silly thing to say when Sam Kerr's in the league, but I've I've backed her for the Golden Boot this year. I was really impressed by what I saw from Steena during uh, the second half of last season, but. When I say that, that's considering the fact that I don't think she was adapted. I don't think she was like fully fit during that time and still finding her feet. But the fundamentals I saw made me think, I think she'll score a hatful for this Arsenal team. What are your, uh, now that she's adapted and, and everything like that, what were your impressions on Stina's first few months at Arsenal? Yeah, I've been really impressed uh, by her because of the fact that you mentioned now uh, her time in Montpellier and, and then. But she came from a really good place, and you can see, you could see that, uh, you could really see that. And she was also a player I was really impressed impressed uh, when I looked. Uh, I think it was Arsenal playing Manchester United when you you played that one one. Yep. And she actually, she she was the player that got you that point you needed to not lose. Uh, and she is that kind of player now. Um, and, and that's where she should be because she is she is like world class. She's one of the best. I, I do think that she is one of the best uh, strikers and, and forwards and number nines there is. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, and there have been, um, you know, some Arsenal fans I've spoken to kind of, you know, not been unimpressed, but thought, mm. but I, I think there's just so much off the ball that she does. And that once this Arsenal team really understands her and once she understands them, I, I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm over egging it, but I just think the qualities are really, really there, particularly in Jonas ball. Um, exactly. That's my opinion. Um, and ho- hopefully we can do something similar for, for Lena Hurtig and then, you know, in Australia next summer, um, Ars- Arsenal will have a hand on that World Cup, just like they had a hand on the European Championship trophy. Three hands, actually. Exactly. Three pairs of hands on that European trophy this summer. But Mia, thanks as ever uh, for your insight there. Really, really kind of really interesting stuff, really interesting background, particularly that stuff that she said in the Swedish press today, which I don't think many people will know about. Mia, I'm absolutely certain that we will have cause to speak again on this podcast uh, after not too long. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thanks to your dogs as well for their contribution. Uh, Yeah, the the sound. Okay, that's all we've got time for on this show. We will be back uh, with another episode around about Tuesday, the 30th of August. Um, I can tell you now our guest on that show, uh, I've been teasing this for a while that we'll have a very special guest and we will indeed. It will be Mr. Ian Wright will be on that podcast and that will be coming out. It looks like we're recording on 30th of August, so it'll be out around about then and that'll be a bit of a season preview. Hopefully by then I might have spoken to a player or two in the build-up to the season, so look out for that at the end of August. Um, But until then, thanks so much for downloading, for listening. Uh, Please leave a review uh, wherever you can and we will speak to you again later this month. Thanks and goodbye. Goodbye.